Welcome in to a special edition with your three New York Yankees beat reporters for the 2024 season. I'm Will Talent, and I'm joined by Lou Orlando and our new New York Yankees beat reporter, Nick Palmer. And we are here to celebrate one of the best days of the year, and that is opening day. The Yankees, they open their 2024 season down in Houston against Jose Altuve and the Houston Astros. Very fitting opening day for the New York Yankees and guys coming off of a 2023 season that was totally disappointing at 82 and 80 lots to unpack lots to get into but before we get into some Yankee baseball how are you two gentlemen doing I am excellent I'm super excited to be joined this year by Nick Palmer my heart hurts that Brian Ravax is no longer with us but I couldn't think of a better person to fill the very large shoes that he left so I'm very excited to work alongside with Nick. Will, we've done it for one year. Let's do it again, babe. And I, I can't wait to get into some Yankees baseball. Hopefully, maybe some better results than last year. I mean, you really said it, Lou. This, is, uh, this has been sort of what I've been aiming at for the last two years. And the fact that I get to do it with two of, might I say, two of my best friends is uh, means a lot. Because uh, you guys are... To, uh, you know, I use the word fountain a lot, so I'm not going to use that. You you guys are two, uh, two uh, wellsprings of Yankees knowledge, uh, and you guys are always a great time, so I'm excited to cover these games with you guys, and uh, it's opening day, you guys. Let's get excited. Nikki P digging deep into the bag of vocabulary, but we're really happy to, happy to have you on board, Nick, and Brian Raybacks, the longest tenured. Yankees beat reporter at WFUV currently. We wish him all the best. He did a lot of great work, but you'll see Brian here and there before his graduation in May. But for this season, it'll be the three of us locking things down coverage wise for your New York Yankees. But guys, let's just jump right into it. And I want to start with a brief recap of those 82 and 80 Yankees from last year. Could never really get anything going. Obviously, Injuries galore all the way through Carlos Rodon, a big injury, never really got going. Nestor Cortez missed a lot of time. And of course, the big one, Aaron Judge, the captain, missing an extensive period of time, still posting an incredible season. But obviously, without Judge in the lineup, there's so many holes. And this offseason, Brian Cashman and company trying to fill those holes, bringing in Juan Soto, Alex Verdugo. They bolster the rotation with Marcus Stroman. Lots of moves. But Anthony Volpe's freshman campaign, something to definitely keep an eye on as he hops into year two. And of course, I don't think we can talk about 2023 without, honestly, one of the more quieter Cy Young Award winners in Garrett Cole. He had a 2.63 ERA last year with 222 strikeouts. Honestly, not even his best season in the major leagues. And that came back in 2019. He won the ERA title, but just came up short to Justin Verlander that year. But gets the Cy Young in 2023. And guys, before we talk about Mr. Cole, because obviously lots of news there with the New York Yankees ace, just give me some general thoughts from last year. Obviously, Lou, you were there with myself seeing a lot of it unfold. And I was, for me personally, I was happy with how the season concluded, getting to see Jason Dominguez and Austin Wells and just younger players coming up through the system and guys that are most likely going to get an opportunity this year. But Lou, just give me some thoughts and reactions to 2023 and what you anticipate for 2024. Listen, I think when you look back to last year, the vibes probably don't match what actually happened on paper uh, for Yankee fans. And I think even the Yankee media, like the season really felt like a drag and it kind of felt like a disaster. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And they still finished with an above 500 record. And obviously that's not the goal. Yankees, it's championship or bust. And that is why there's so much pressure on them this year. But you finish 82 and 80. Throughout that season, I think there are quiet success stories. Glaber Torres posts a positive OPS+. plus. Uh, some guys in the pitching staff do really well, and you get some nice bullpen. Obviously, Cole, Clark Schmidt. So uh, there's nice pieces. Anthony Volpe goes through maybe some warts in his rookie season, but you see a lot of promise. So I think, to me, there's some belief that it can't be as bad as last year. 
So that's at least maybe some sense of assurance that you filled the positions of need that you kind of identified towards last year when you look at the holes in the lineup. But still injuries coming into this year. I still think Yankee fans should be largely positive. This feels like Cashman took the issues that happened last year seriously and made moves to address them, whether or not they're going to work. That's why we watch the season and we'll see. But there's at least been some effort that, hey, last year can't happen again, and we're not going to let it happen again. And that's kind of, I think, the mindset going into this year. And Nick, Lou brings up two very important bright spots that really didn't get enough love in 2023 in Glaber Torres. And the number one bullpen in baseball was the New York Yankees, despite having really no standout arm. I want to ask you, Nick, what is the direction now for Glaber Torres and that bullpen? Glaber Torres obviously needing a new contract and the Yankees still with solid names in that bullpen, but no real standout arm to get those real needed three outs in the ninth inning. Yeah, you mentioned it. Uh, the Torres contract is going to be one of the biggest storylines going out of this year. I mean, it's not every day you're going to find a second baseman with an OPS over 800 consistently. So that is going to be at the top of the docket. As far as the bullpen is concerned, I am, uh, I'm a little bit worried. Uh, the Yankees, I think, aren't ready to admit to themselves that they relied on Wandy Peralta a lot last year. And missing him is going to be a big, big issue. And also just that sort of goes with the whole uh, just outlook on the entire Yankees lineup. I'm, uh, I, was, I was very excited thinking that Rizzo was back at the beginning of spring training and everyone's back, everything looks good, and that injuries are not going to be the things that plagues them this year. In the last week and a half of spring training, the injury bug bites them all over and then I find myself thinking we might be looking at a repeat of at least how the rosters managed last year because I want to run through some names with you who we saw on the lineup consistently last year and I just want to know if that's like something you would be down to sign up for because if we remember I mean Jake Bowers played 84 games last year as Waldo Cabrera showed up uh, in 115, Willie Calhoun, if you remember him, Franchi Cordero, like, you know, Josh Donaldson, Flo played a bunch of games. Uh, you know, IKF is no longer here. So Billy McKinney played a lot of games. You have a lot of guys who, you know, played the role because Rizzo was hurt, LeMahieu was hurt, all these guys are hurt. And we were thinking, okay, we don't have to deal with that again this year. Well, guess what? Rizzo's now hurt again. LeMahieu is now hurt again. And yeah, we're going to have Rizzo here and ready to go, but you don't know how long that's going to be for. LeMahieu is indefinite. Uh, Cole is hurt. So now that you're running into a lot of these same issues, I'm worried that, okay, yeah, you have Soto Grisham. And I think John Birdie is going to help a lot with that. But I, I see myself running into a lot of the same issues that they ran into last year. And now you don't want to be hanging the, hanging the season on the injury hat again. You, you can't do that. I'll say this, uh, less really less worried about like a Willie Calhoun, Jake Bowers, Franchi Gordero situation. I actually like the outfield depth where you can lose an outfielder, probably not Judge because you can't replace a guy like Judge, but you can lose an outfielder in between whether you want to sprinkle standing in and just the fact that you have Verdugo, Soto, Grisham, who I think I'm fine with Grisham having to get a run where he's just starting in center field like he's an average to above average MLB player when he's really going so that the outfield depth to me right now is fine unless they really get ravaged. And at that point, it's kind of, what do you do? The big concern I think is the infield because you're already thin. Oswaldo Cabrera is going to be your starting third baseman. I think he and birdie are going to rotate in. So that's already a little thin. And you mentioned like, there's no guarantee that LeMay ever gets back. This toe has been bothering him for feels like the last three years now Rizzo. There's always going to be concerns. God forbid Volpe or Glaber goes down. Like that's a whole world where the infield depth is really troubling. I kind of agree with you bullpen wise too. I don't think anyone's talked enough about how big the loss of Wandy Peralta is. I'm excited to see what Matt Blake can do with Caleb Ferguson and Victor Gonzalez in that LA trade. You get two lefties there that are in the pen that clearly the Yankees like and Matt Blake like that they go out and they get those guys. But I think you look at the bullpen and for the first time, I don't think it's a guarantee that like, yep, the bullpen's just going to get outs and be locked down. 
I think the bullpen might surprise some people because I feel like that's what always happened is one or two guys step up like what Ian Hamilton did last year. You're always going to find a guy in the rough that comes out of nowhere. But I do think that there's reason to look at the bullpen and be like, it's probably the weakest bullpen the Yankees have had in some time. Granted, they've had a lot of good bullpens. So you're comparing them against a lot of good staffs. But um, yeah, I think it's fair to look at the bullpen and be like, yeah, that's not the strongest we've seen in a minute. And and Will, I, I just want to get your take on this because I was looking at the rotation this morning, a coalless rotation. And then I thought, wow, the only person who I can trust to give up five solid innings in this rotation is Clark Schmidt. Mm, that's How, interesting. That was a crazy thing for me to sort of realize that. I was like, we don't know what we're going to get from Nestor this year. We don't know what we're going to get from Heal for sure. And we sure as heck don't know what we're going to get from Rodon. So, I mean, I, I don't know. My take on that is that Clark Schmidt definitely is a name where you're like, all right, he's going to go out there and he should give you five to six solid innings. Hopefully he builds on what he had last year because last year throwing the most amount of innings he's ever thrown. I think now what's really good for Clark Schmidt is that there's no bouncing around. That's been my whole hang up with Clark Schmidt, a first round pick and the Yankees have kind of used him in this long reliever six, seventh inning guy, or he'll start games. Like that's, that needs to stop. Let's pick a lane with Clark Schmidt. This guy was a great arm at the University of South Carolina. You drafted him in the first round for a reason. Let's give him his actual job. So now he's a four starter. He's not that five guy because Michael King is gone. So he has a bona fide spot. Give him those innings. Give him those starts. I think he has an improved year from last year. I like heel rounding out the rotation we'll see what they get from him there's not too much to expect he only threw in four innings in low a tampa last year and marcus stroman is going to be a pivotal inning eater as well an all-star coming off of last season really like the signing there but yes nick rodone and cortez the biggest question marks and the two trusted i would say most trusted arms as of right now and thankfully for rodone he had a very solid spring. So, you know, we'll see where that goes. But let's jump into Garrett Cole for just a second. He had some nerve irritation in his throwing elbow. He won't throw for about a month. He hasn't missed a start since 2016. So this is uh, something out of character for him. He's always very efficient and very healthy. And he said, accord- according to an athletic article, I felt pretty good leaving the doctor and I'll take his word because he's a guy that really knows his body. So Nestor Cortez, he will start opening day down in Houston. That game slated to start in just about three hours from recording time. But I want to get your guys' overall expectation. Let's just say until June, where do you see the Yankees going with this rotation? Is it going to be lacking that Cashman's going to go out and have to get an arm at the end of April? Or do we have enough faith in this rotation? Hey, maybe even Clayton Beater comes in and makes a spot start as the sixth man. I think there's a lot of options, but I'm curious to see what you guys think. It's a, it's a great question. Go ahead, Luke. Go ahead. No, Nick, please. You got it first. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, I, it's going to come down to the bullpen, which is a weird answer to that. But I think if the bullpen can string them through until Cole gets back, I don't think that it's going to be an issue. So, like, yeah, you can have you can have Heel throw up a couple duds, and maybe you have Clark throw up a dud, and maybe Nestor has a bad outing or two, and Radon blows up once or twice. But so long as, in my mind, if if four – these are the four arms that I'm looking for in the bullpen to where if they perform, I don't think the Yankees are going to be in trouble. It's going to be number one is Laza, right? Cause if, if Loisaga can be the closer because you're missing, you know, you're missing King and you're missing Peralta. So, you know, you definitely need Loisaga. Loisaga is your number one. You need him to go. If Loisaga doesn't go, your season might be over. Like, is that, is that a crazy thing to say? Not at all. And his health is also definitely a concern. A guy that really can't consistently stay healthy. Right. And sec- second, Ian Hamilton. Ian Hamilton is so, so huge for this team. We saw him last year. He was so big. Uh, third, Tommy Canely. We need a big rebound year from Tommy Canely. We know what his abilities are. If we could have him come back, that would be big. And um, who's my fourth guy? Fourth guy is Ron. 
Ron Marinaccio, so big for Ron Marinaccio. If we have those four guys going, I could see the Yankees throwing out Keel and Beater and still feeling good and winning games. Well, I remember, like, Mar- Marinaccio, if I'm not mistaken, ended last season down in the minors. Like, that is... Didn't make the opening day roster. Didn't for make this the opening year, day we'll roster. Into, like, but... that is a huge swing guy that if he works his way back to the major league level, was so good the first half of the season. I think you have to talk about Clay Holmes because Clay Holmes is going to be their closer opening day, and I, I probably is going to be their closer for most of this season unless everything goes completely awry. Um, but when I look at this rotation... Will, you asked, is there any way that they make a move at the end of April? I don't think so. I did, I just, I just, think that if, if a move comes, it, it comes towards the deadline, and it might come regardless of Cole's health. I know that Cole said he feels good, but for me and my expectations, I'm really not expecting Cole back until the summer. I get yeah. really worried about when I hear things about recovery process taking a long time if you remember that's what happened with Nestor last year is he started to feel like he couldn't recover in five days and it really the rest of his season steamrolled he was never the same it's something that you hear a lot of Tommy John guys say is that oh the recovery is not there I know that the test didn't show anything but the word that the Yankees used was we're going to reevaluate in a month so he's going to go back for more tests so I'm not sounding up the alarm bell about like Cole's going to be out for the year or anything like that. I just think, and it probably would make sense for the Yankees to be as cautious as they can with Cole. There's no point in rushing him back in May if it's going to hurt him down the stretch. You want Cole to be fully healthy, no holds barred. There is a potential for this rotation not just to be uh, solid, to be good. Because I think Luis Heal is the best possible fifth arm that could have gone into this rotation. Uh, you were hearing a lot of rumblings about, like, is it going to be Luke Weaver? Is it going to be Clayton Beater? Luis Heal was amazing in 2021. I mean, I think he set the world on fire his first three starts where he didn't allow an earned run and maybe had some trouble down the stretch and then gets Tommy John in 2022. But this guy has elite stuff. It's only a three pitch Mets, but that fastball plays, that slider plays. Like that is a fifth arm that you can get excited about because I think he can be a really solid high threes, low fours kind of guy. Stroman pitched really well in spring training. I think you have reason to be excited there. The big question marks are Nestor and Rodon. Rodon showed really good glimpses in spring training. Nestor struggled, so that makes you nervous. Um, I'm big on Clark. Like there's a chance that this rotation can do well. Even if they don't, I think this team gives them the time to figure that stuff out where there's not going to be the panic button sounding four weeks in if this rotation ERA is a little high because a lot of these guys have done it at a high level where they're not going to panic. Well, Will, I'm I'm glad you actually both of you brought up Rodon because I feel like he's – I think he's – yes he's obviously the most important like what if factor but I think there's also the most reason to be excited about Rodon coming into this year um I don't think he got a fair look from Yankees fans because if you remember last year he was coming off that back injury halfway through the season I mean that's hard for anyone um but even if you look at how he sort of adjusted over spring training like he developed that cutter which is huge for him because what people were pouncing on last year was they were waiting for the fastball because it was a flat four seamer. And when he was only throwing fastball slider 85% of the time, and then throwing a curveball into change up once a game, if you sit on the fastball and it doesn't have any movement on it, you're just going to crush that. And people, his barrel percentage actually doubled last year because people were finally catching on to it. So now that he is a cutter, he's going to be able to pick the corners and actually throw heat like on the black, which is going to be nice for him. So I'm big on Rodon this year. And one thing too, that was, I really, really impressed me with Rodon throughout spring training was that people were kind of concerned about his velo going in because he was sitting low nineties and then he built it up. That's a good sign. That means he's not rushing himself. He's getting into a groove and he just kind of got better and better with each start in February and March. I'm very excited for him. Why? Because say he has a 2021 White Sox year, 2022 Giants year. I think without Cole, if Rodon is your ace, then, you know, that and he could pitch like he did with the Giants. 
that's that is a you know that's a horse to have at the top of your rotation he was one of the more unhittable arms in 2022 and that's what the yankees spent big on so we were also talking about some hidden gems that brian cashman has found in terms of this year as well victor gonzalez and caleb ferguson to go back to last year ian hamilton so let's just go through the opening day roster Real quick, as Garrett Cole will be placed on the 60-day IL, obviously taking a lot of precaution there. The rotation will be as follows. Nestor Cortez, Carlos Rodon, Marcus Stroman, Clark Schmidt, Luis Heal. Returning relief pitchers, Luke Weaver, Ian Hamilton, Clay Holmes, Jonathan Lawizaga. Now, top one of, the, one of their top 10 prospects, Clayton Beater, he makes the team. Uh, Caleb Ferguson and Victor Gonzalez, as I said, but one of the big names I really want to point out, and he's really not a big name, but he is quite the fireballer. He threw some smoke with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and that's Nick Birdie. This is a guy that has really flown under the radar, came in on a minor league deal. He throws gas. I can really see Nick Birdie being a kind of guy that has a Ian Hamilton situation where he always had good stuff, but never really put it together. Now you get Matt Blake to kind of help him out there. And I can really see Nick Birdie being the name that we are like, wow, I need Birdie in in the seventh inning so we can go Birdie, Canely, or whoever, and then Holmes. Definitely keep an eye on Nick Birdie. For catchers, Jose Trevino and Austin Wells in the infield, it'll be Rizzo, Torres Volpe, and John Birdie, who we'll get into. The Yankees just traded for him uh, yesterday. In the outfield, this is good. This is really good. Four good outfielders right here. Trent Grisham, Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, Alex Verdugo, Jake Bowers, and Billy McKinney. I tip my cap to them. They were amazing for what the Yankees needed last year, but as you were saying, Lou, if Judge does go down, I'm fine with Grisham in center. And even with Dominguez coming back, if let's say Judge and Dominguez are out at the same time from left to right, if it's Verdugo, Grisham, Soto, that's awesome. That is really, really good. Giancarlo Stanton as the only designated hitter. And for utility, it'll be the starting third baseman today as Waldo Cabrera and Jemai Jones. He makes the final cut. So, you know, guys, I like this opening day roster, obviously, subject to change. Who's missing? Obviously, DJ LeMayhew, Oswald Peraza. That's why you have guys like John Birdie and Jemai Jones making their way onto the team. Jemai Jones, an experienced vet, another contact back and play all three outfield positions and pretty much everywhere except first in the infield. So I like that. Aaron Boone kept him on the roster, but let's talk about John Birdie for just a second. A three-way trade between the Yankees, Marlins, and Tampa Bay Rays. John Birdie comes over to New York from Miami. Ben Reutvet, the last piece remaining in the Josh Donaldson, IKF, Gary Sanchez, Gio Urshela trade. He goes to Tampa Bay. That just smells terrible to me for a whole bunch of different reasons because that just sounds like a three homer game coming real soon in July. Yep. But then John Cruz, an outfield prospect for the Yankees. He goes over to Miami, but the main headliner for the Yankees, John Birdie, he won't get the start today. 249 against left-handed pitchers, 262 against righties, 34 year old vet, but he's got the speed. And Lou, before we hopped on, you made a great comparison because that's really what it's the kind of player that he is just a little better. He's like a Tim Lo Castro with a lot more bat and maybe just a little bit less speed, but he's going to bat. I want to say either lead off or nine and on certain days, try to get you some base hits. He's got solid defense, but where he really makes that money is by swiping bags. Yeah. I don't know if this is this comparison I'm about to make makes Yankee fans super excited, but I think he's like a high high upside combination of what IKF was supposed to be and what Tim LaCastro is, where, you know, John Bray's going to be a guy that can play anywhere, can play on the left side of the infield, which is something the Yankees didn't have once DJ went down outside of their starters, can throw him in the outfield if you need him to. Great speed. Again, maybe not Tim LaCastro fast, because when the Yankees got LaCastro, he was the fastest guy in baseball, but led the National League in stolen bases two years ago in – I think a relatively smaller sample size did not play the full season. So there's a guy that if he gets full run is going to steal some bangs. I like his bat solid contact bat, hovering around the league average OPS mark, but 
It's a guy they're going to have for two years. So this is not just this is not like a Jemai Jones move, right? Where I think you can legitimately wonder how long is Jemai Jones going to be on this roster? Is he even going to make it through April? John Birdie is a guy that should be a Yankee, I think, for the next two years. And even if he's relegated to the utility role, like, honestly, the way that DJ LeMay was initially supposed to be when they brought him over, like, that might be John Birdie's role. And that's not a bad thing. I think you're fine if he gets some run here early because of DJ's injury. There's a lot in his game that should excite you again. Like don't, he's not like this all-star caliber player, but I think he's a very solid contributor that brings a lot to the table that honestly the Yankees needed more of. And yeah, Nick, he had his best year last year, 114 hits, a 294 average, but he's not just fast. He is a legitimately good base stealer, 92 steals to 20 caught stealings in his career. Yeah, I I like him. If if I had to liken him to a player, it's probably like a Jeremy Pena um, for the Astros, just in the sense that they yes, the name of their game is speed. Uh, Pena had well, he had a big fall off last year, but and Birdie actually the opposite. But I I, the way he's going to get on base is going to be ground balls through the infield. Think like a Jeff McNeil sort of poke it through sort of style, and then he's going to be you know, adding that value by swiping the bag, like you mentioned. So I don't hate that. I think the Yankees need a little bit of that. And, um, you know, we've, I think we've always been talking about the Yankees needing to play a little bit of smaller baseball, a little bit of small ball. And I think Brady could help a lot with that. I think, you know, since 2018, the Yankees have really, really needed that. And every year, it just seems like you can't really have enough of that with this Yankees squad. Power, never really an issue for the in the Aaron Boone tenure, that is. So anytime you can get a piece like John Birdie on your team, if you're Brian Cashman, you got to go with it. It didn't cost you a whole lot. Obviously, Ben Reutvet was just kind of a throw in. He was going to be a backup all the way for the Yankees and maybe because he was only like 23 when they got him, he could have blossomed into something, but tons of injuries. He ended up being Cole's like personal catcher, helping him towards that Cy Young. But Ben Roy bet he goes to the Tampa Bay Rays and instantly slots in as the number two guy down there. So he'll get an opportunity, but let's talk about the lineup specifically for today against the Houston Astros and Framber Valdez, an excellent starting pitcher. He's going to take over for Justin Verlander, who's a little banged up, but obviously one of the better one-two punches in baseball going righty and lefty Framber with that big sweeping breaking ball and that four-seamer that really runs up on you, kind of like Nestor Cortez's fastball, but at even higher velocities. So let's break it down. Torres will bat leadoff at second base. It's going to be Soto in right field batting second. Judge. A spot that we don't normally see him in. He'll be in the three hole playing center field. Very comfortable for right now with him being the center fielder. Long term this season, I don't love it. I want them to save him as much as possible. But for right now, totally fine with it. Stanton, he will be the DH batting fourth. Rizzo, the first baseman in the five hole. Volpe at short. Verdugo in left. Trevino behind the dish and Cabrera at third base to round out the lineup and uh, Nestor Cortez, the lefty nasty Nestor. He will get his first opening day start, but guys, I got to say this instantly before we even mention anything about an individual player. This is probably the most balanced opening day lineup that Aaron Boone has ever had in his seven years as Yankees manager. I mean, you can yeah. almost go righty lefty down the line with it. And that's even with your bench pieces too. Like that's what should excite you is there's so much maneuverability with this lineup. Like the fact that you can go against the lefty, you can put judge and Stanton back to back. And then you get Rizzo hitting lefty in the five hole. You could move Rizzo up to four if you need to. Uh, when you get DJ back, there's so many different things you can do with lead off hitter and stuff like that. Like Boone's going to have a lot of customization that he can do with this lineup, they sh- people should be excited about it. I think it's a very solid lineup overall. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, you know, I the one area where I think at least I was at first scratching my head, but then, but then I realized that it's actually Valdez on the mound and not Verlander was, I wanted to see Wells starting on opening day, but um, 
you know, Wells is lefty and, you know, Framber's lefty. So, so that, and then it makes sense to go Trevino and, and I actually don't hate that. So. I think yeah. it's curious to see how much of the starts Wells will get against righties, because obviously if you're doing the strict righty lefty split, well, we wouldn't see Trevino that much because there are less lefties in the league. Right. I'm curious to see how much run Austin Wells gets. Cause he is a sneaky, sneaky X factor guy where if he can build off of what, that little taste we saw of him last year, if he can rake, the way we saw him rake every once in a while in spring training, like that could be a guy that you think back to what Gary Sanchez did for those Yankees lineups in the late 2010s. When you have a catcher that you can slot five or six that can hit for power, that lengthens your lineup to an exponential degree. You know, you know what I want to see, Lou? I want to see Rizzo return to hitting doubles down the line, and I want to see Wells taking over the role of hitting those like sort of long or not those sort of pop-ups to right field that end up like porching. Like maybe it'll be the second deck, but you know what Rizzo was doing where he was sort of like getting under them and they were, they were just sort of like looping out into right field and end up running out. I'd like to see Wells taking over that role and seeing Rizzo start hitting. So that would be nice to see. And I like your point too, Nick, you want to see Austin Wells get out there as early as possible because, you know, first round pick back in 2020, taking him a couple years to develop, obviously a big bat at the university of Arizona. But to me, I love Trevino being in there just because opening day, got to have your best possible defensive alignment. Trevino, obviously coming off an injury riddled season that shouldn't take away from the fact that he was a platinum glove winner, let alone the gold glove winner for catchers in AL for 2022 so you go out there with your best possible defensive rotation and that platoon option isn't bad because well is obviously not known for defense but something that he has definitely gotten better at in the minor leagues i remember when the yankees drafted him he was instantly labeled as a kyle schwarber type major league comp before he even stepped on a professional field no one really gave him a shot to improve on his defense and the yankees stuck with him and he is a catcher on the roster he's not a first baseman he's not a dh he's not an outfielder he is coming up as a catcher and i really really like that they're going to stick with him all the way through and he's really not that bad defensively give him some reps see where he goes he could become one of the better ones who knows just give him the opportunity but definitely moving forward i would venture to think trevino will probably start tomorrow as well depending on who pitches for the astros but you know opening series two you want to kind of get your you know your main nine out there and you'll see where wells fits into that you never know it's always it's always different. Game one's lineup is always different than game 162's. If they're the same, you're either really, really good. But even if you're really, really bad, the lineup is definitely not going to be the same on opening day as it will be on game 162. I'll say this about Trevino, though. I Listen, he's not. I don't think he's going to be an all-star this year. He was dealing with a wrist injury last year. I think you'll see the hitting get back to a league average level last year. It got to a really bad spot last year this year i think he'll be closer to league average and I, I think wells is probably still the more not probably he's the more exciting bat for sure but i think trevino will be less of a negative impact in a black hole at the bottom of that lineup i was gonna say if trevino could hover 260 255 i i would be okay with that i think that's a great year for him i would even go lower than that if he can go like 240 and just give you that like a gold glove-esque defense. Give me a gold glove finalist finish for him. You don't have to win it. But if you're that good that you're a finalist, you were obviously really good defensively. They have so many different bats in that lineup that, you know, in 2022, they got lucky with what Trevino was doing offensively. I don't think there's near as much pressure on him to come up with a big hit. And he does that regardless. He's not going to give you 30 home runs, but he'll be a scrappy bat and he'll be a pest to get out. And defensively, he is just a unit. So Jose Trevino, Austin Wells, really excited for the tandem that the Yankees are going out behind the dish. They're not tremendous names but, uh, yet, but they're very, very good options for this team. But let's look at the big picture for all of 2024. After the conclusion of this year, Juan Soto, a free agent, Alex Verdugo, a free agent. Obviously, it was very clear that Brian Cashman and company were all in in 2024. So what does that signal 
for Aaron Boone and Brian Cashman in 2024. I'll give you an example. Jordan Montgomery on the market for the entirety of the offseason just now signs with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Just a one-year deal, $25 million with a vesting option if he starts for 10 games, so the first two months, so to say, he will get another $25 million and another year. But with that signing right there, that signaled to me that Cashman is at least safe for up until July, no matter what. Because if he wasn't, I think Jordan Montgomery would have been a Yankee as soon as Garrett Cole went down. And possibly even Blake Snell would have been a Yankee as soon as Garrett Cole went down. So I think Cashman's job right now is good depending on where they go with the season. And obviously, depending on what they do at the trade deadline, moves are always going to have to be made. This team will not be complete in July. No team ever is. And if the only move they make is getting Keenan Middleton um, and they're, you know, obvious pieces away from, you know, beating the Orioles, beating the Rays, beating the Astros, whoever it is in the American League, and those moves aren't made and they fall short to those teams. I think we have some changes on the horizon. Yeah, I I wonder how all in they are in this season. Like, obviously, they're in on the World Series. They're making a push. You don't trade for one, so if you're not doing that, but like if the, if you felt like this was and your last extend chance, him right away. Sorry to interrupt, there, but yes, they, there's clear interest that they want to extend sort of long term, and so if they felt like, mm, and it's not a lot that they'll get him, but if they really felt like we don't have a good chance at signing Soto after this year, then I think you see them make a push, whether it's a big one year deal for Monty or even a longer term deal for deal for Snell, just because you have to take advantage of this year. There's clearly still some long term plan here. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I, I think Cashman's job, things would have to get really bad for either Cashman or Boone to get in trouble. Maybe Boone would be on the chopping block if this season goes like last season. I don't think this season's going to go like last year. The Yankees are in a pretty good spot to win games and battle in a really tough division. So I, my my head going into this season is not looking to start calling for people's jobs because, frankly, I Sure, could he have done more? I think Brian Cashman had a pretty good dead, uh, a pretty good off season. When you go and you get Juan Soto like that, it's hard for me to complain. And you know what? Marcus Stroman was a good pickup, so I'm not going to be coming at him, especially early now. I kind of want to see how everything shakes out. They've earned both Boone and Cashman to me. They've earned some job security right now with this off season. You know what, Lou? If the Yankees lose today, sell Torres immediately. <laughs> For whatever value he has, You're DFA right. Stanton, <laughs> trade Cole. That's the one. And re sign Soto. If the Yankees lose today, the season's over. Lock it in. Wow. 0 oh, 1 and it's toast. We're already 0 oh, 1. 0 oh, 1, you got to blow it up. You got to know when to walk away. <laughs> Well, I have a couple more questions in terms of the big picture. I want to hear what you guys have to think because obviously, this was, I want to say, the reason. On top of a lot of other things that went wrong for the Yankees, Aaron Judge not playing at least 135 games. I would preferably, if I were Aaron Boone or Brian Cashman, I want to see Judge in there for 145 plus every year. But I'll give him 135 this year if he can consistently be out there for 135 games. Because obviously with the lineup that they have, you can rest guys pretty periodically. Hopefully that everyone is clicking offensively was another thing not everyone was clicking offensively a lot of people had some of their worst offensive years ever last year that's another thing to keep in mind but in your eyes is 135 a solid number or are you guys like at the point where it's like no 150 or more how many games do you guys think Aaron Judge realistically needs to play in order for the Yankees to succeed you know If Aaron Judge sits every five games, I can live with that. If Aaron Judge takes a seat every five games, I can live with that because, and this is, this might be the most naive thing I've ever said. I'm banking on Stanton to get a lot of at bats because he will not be playing the outfield this year. Because Stanton will not touch the outfield grass, hopefully. 
hopefully god willing praying because we have so many outfielders hopefully stan will be able to stay healthy and therefore judge will be able to get enough rest time because you have again hopefully a solid bat in your dh role that it shouldn't be an issue judge playing every five days i live with that and that's enough for him to make enough of an impact that the yankees make the playoffs also soto should be playing every day as well I'll say this. Back in 2019, Judge only played 102 games. And now, obviously, the Yankees' offense went off and they were able to withstand it. So that's not the benchmark, certainly, because 2019, along with the juice balls, like that season during the regular season was magical for the Yankees. Um, I think you could get away. 120 to 130, I think, is a fair range. Having Juan Soto in this lineup and the fact that he played every single game last year that he really doesn't get hurt. Hope I'm not jinxing anything. Having another, basically another Aaron Judge in the lineup. Juan Soto is one of the top 10 hitters in baseball and a guy that just completely changes the complexion of the lineup. Like we talked about how important Soto was to this team. It's, I I don't know if it's really set in for people yet. Like you have another elite, elite hitter in this lineup. And I think you're going to see some guys bounce back. It's going to be very unlikely that you only have two starters with an OPS plus over 100 again this season. So, yes, Judge going down was a big reason for why they struggled last year. But the other part of it was that they had no one to step up once he did go down. Dude, and that shouldn't, and- that shouldn't be the case this year. So I think you can be a little careful with Judge, especially if he's going to play center field. That's going to be a bigger wear and tear on his body. Um and with the fact that hopefully you have Dominguez coming back mid-season, maybe late in August, or whatever that's going to be, that you can give Judge rest days, as long as the rest of the lineup does their role and Juan Soto stays healthy, that you can get more than just get by. You can win plenty of baseball games with Judge playing. I like that mark, 135. Well, that's a really solid mark. And in my mind, if Rizzo does what Rizzo's supposed to do, knock 280 in the three-hole, and Torres does what Torres is supposed to do, have an over 800 OPS as a second baseman, to me, doesn't even really matter like what Verdugo does. And it doesn't really matter if Stanton hits, you know, if Stanton hits 25 bombs instead of 35, but Rizzo and Torres are doing their job, I can live with that because the one through, you know, the one through four is so damn formidable that it shouldn't even matter. And, you know, of all the names we're mentioning, uh, six years ago, seven years ago, this was the Juan Soto trade of the time when Giancarlo Stanton came over from Miami. And I know, Nick, it was not pleasant to watch him in the outfield, but watching him play in spring training, obviously a lot leaner than last year, looking a lot more athletic, changed his workout regimen, as he was saying when camp broke. And, and it was very obvious a picture of him and Aaron Judge standing side by side in 2018. They were almost identically the same person, you know, stature wise. Now, Giancarlo does not look like the same body type that the Yankees acquired. And I like that because he needed to change. He's going to be 35 years old coming up this year. He needed to take care of his body. It's already a very, you know... his body breaks on him easily as it is when he was in his early twenties, he was having injuries where he was down for months at a time. So now he needs to try and, you know, train his body to not just break down on him naturally. You know, obviously he had that injury where he got hit in the face with a pitch, you know, for a lot of freak injuries with Giancarlo and a lot of hamstring injuries he's done a lot to change his diet his workout regimen this is a guy that I don't feel like a lot of people give enough credit to who really tries to you know help his body and keep himself on the field as much as he can he's just got a fragile body and to me guys of all the names that we're saying right now I think John Carlos Stanton is the x factor coming in to 2024 and that is because If he does hit 30 home runs at 34, 35 years old, he's not a name right now, in my opinion, that Yankee fans are banking on for that. Obviously, they went out and got Juan Soto. You're banking on Aaron Judge being healthy this year. Giancarlo is just not that big bopper name anymore. But the way that he was swinging the bat in spring training, I know it's spring training, but... 
watching him all of last year, we didn't really see those at bats that he took in spring training this year at all in the regular season last year. Just looks so much more comfortable up there. And I just got to say, if it's not Giancarlo, who is your X factor? And if it is Giancarlo, why is he your X factor? Go ahead, Lou. Uh, you look like you really want to say things. So I please go Nick first. has a take. I, to I, get I off. have an answer. He was, he was I have an answer. Who's good takes off? Um, the X factor this year, Jean Carlos Stanton's a good answer, and we're talking just hitters, right? right? Because yeah, yeah, let, let, offensively, let's say offensively, yep. The X factor this year is DJ Lemayhew. Um, I don't mind that either. That's a good take. If Lemayhew is on, this lineup is so insanely well rounded because that just takes away the leadoff question. And allow and takes all the pressure off Torres and Volpe to hit. When Torres and Volpe don't have any pressure to get on base because Lemayhew's doing it already, it it frees them up to take, you know, it take it frees up Torres to take bigger hit hacks, which ends up being you know like those porch jobs to right field that he'll like hit on line drives the opposite way, or like those slicing line drives that end up going over the fence. So it allows Torres to hit more extra base hits and allows Boldy to not worry about getting on base, and it frees up the rest of the lineup. So if LeMahieu's on this lineup, I think is probably the second best lineup in baseball, which is crazy to say. I, I think you're both right. Because, yeah, DJ LeMahieu brings something to the table that most hitters in this lineup don't. And for John Carlos Stanton, for the first time really in his Yankees career, not just the Yankee fans, I don't think the Yankees are expecting – a ton of ever not maybe not expected the Yankees aren't relying on him to be a high powered offensive bat. Like he can be league average and this offense will still operate because you'd have judge and Soto and Rizzo. You have other guys that they're banking on to mash in the middle of that lineup where, you know, there's a world where if Stan really struggles and Dominguez gets healthy, like we might see Stan out of this lineup. I don't think that's going to happen because I like to buy into what I've seen from Giancarlo this spring. I still believe that there's a really good hitter in there. Um, I think you've both given really good X factors. I don't think this guy is an X factor quite to the level that you guys are talking about, but I do think it would change the complexion of the lineup if Anthony Volpe takes the leap in his yeah. sophomore campaign. Absolutely. Absolutely. That shoot the gaps hitter that with, with still some pop because, man, 20 home runs by Anthony Volpe last year was awesome. If he can take some of the strikeout out of his game, I would honestly, I'd take a little bit of a power dip if it meant that we raised that average up to like 270. He's getting on base, he's stealing bags, he's shooting stuff down the line. I kind of like that, uh, you know, shoot gap oppo mentality of hitting. If he can be that in the bottom third of the lineup or six, whatever they're going to hit him, that gives you another quote unquote DJ LeMahieu type, maybe not fully to the extent of DJ, but it gives you another guy like that that's fast, gets on base, and could be a game changer, that that is people – take leap, people take a big leap from their freshman year, from their rookie season to their second season. That I, that could be a big change or two. Lou, you just, you just gave me a revelation, and I'm, gonna, I'm changing my answer to Volpe. Because <laughs> if, Volpe, if Volpe works, okay, Volpe's hitting 270, steals 25 bags, right? You put him in the nine hole. It's like Guardian Jeter back in the old days. Exactly. And then you have Volpe into Torres, into Soto, into Judge, into Rizzo, into Stanton, into LeMahieu. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Into, into Verdugo, into Wells, and then back to Volpe. Good. That's a good lineup. That's a that is a good lineup. lineup. There's a lot so of So Volpe there. has to be the X factor then, because that bridges the entire lineup together. I don't know. I, I do Stanton. Getting back to like yeah. 2020s, early 2020s, late 2010s form, not like Marlins form, but just what do you give me? All star MVP stand from 2022. What we saw, like what he's like in the playoffs, if he gets a couple heaters like that and he gets you the 30 home runs, right. like that's just another huge bat in the lineup. I think there's like, there's no one right answer. Right. But there are a few guys that can really like you expect Judge to go, you expect Soto to go. Frankly, I think we're kind of expecting Rizzo to go. Yeah. Um, but there are guys like DJ and Volpe and Stanton that are more question marks that if they go, my goodness, what this lineup looks like.
Oh my gosh, if Torres doesn't go. Torres, I'm expecting to go, right? Like if that, Torres doesn't go, though, how... That would be that an extra factor the other way, yeah. That would be killer. And Anthony Volpe, obviously a name that we really haven't talked about a whole lot. I was very close to picking him as my X factor as well, but I go with Giancarlo for this reason and this reason only. It's because Giancarlo, the ex- more experienced MLB bat, um, obviously a much heftier price tag. You want to see more out of him. And I think you can get there faster with Giancarlo than Anthony Volpe. But I think the lack of noise around Anthony Volpe is why he will take that leap in 2024. Way too much noise surrounding Anthony Volpe. Something that he just did not deserve. Although I guess if you want to say he did because he lit the minor leagues on fire going 40 for 40 and then last year a 20 for 20 season, but that average obviously at 209 wins the gold glove and plays in 159 games. Obviously some at bats a lot uglier than others, but there was so much good to take out of Anthony Volpe's season last year I know it wasn't the number one overall prospect like Jackson Holiday or Gunnar Henderson he didn't win the rookie of the year he got rookie of the year votes and won the gold glove out of every shortstop in the American League and he still had the second most errors but he saved the most runs Anthony Volpe, I think, has the chance to have one of the better seasons on the Yankees because of the limited amount of pressure behind him. He doesn't have that top prospect label anymore. That is in the rear view mirror. He'll always have it to some degree because everyone will look at Volpe and say, hey, remember how much hype that kid from New Jersey had? That will always be there. But the talent that he possesses, 20 20 season for him, 21 home runs and 24 stolen bags. I know you guys are saying 270, and that is awesome. I would love that. I would love if he even just batted 250 because that would be an improvement from 209. And if that requires him to hit 15 to 20 home runs, I'm cool with that because that most likely means he's going to get more hits. And then that'll be, let's just, you know, throw a number out there. 17 home runs and 30 stolen bases. That's even better than 2020. He's getting on base and then creating runs for the guys at the top. Let's say Volpe gets on base like you were just saying, Nick. He's like a second leadoff guy if he, you know, goes with more of the contact. If he can get to that contact side and yeah, limit some of those strikeouts, he's on base. Boom. He swipes second base. Glaber Torres, then Juan Soto, then Aaron Judge. There's three all-star bats some MVP bats to drive in Volpe and Volpe can create offense on his own with his own stick, not just with the legs. So Anthony Volpe is going to be pivotal this year, but pivotal in an individual way. If he can take his own game to the next level, the Yankees will highly, highly benefit from it. So let's head into some predictions. Now for me, I'm going to say Anthony Volpe has a 2025, um, I'm sorry, a 25-25 season. I think he goes deep 25 times. I think he steals over 25 bags and he hits over 250. A lot of twos and fives there. I know it kind of lines up, but I think that is where Anthony, Anthony Volpe goes. So if you guys have any individual predictions, love to hear it. But obviously we will get into our record predictions for the New York Yankees and where they will end up. But Lou, I'll start with you. Is there any, you know, slash line stats for an individual player that you could see panning out in 2024? I'm going to go rotation. I saw one online that was, they think Luis Heal is going to stay in the rotation once Cole gets back. I don't think so. I think it'd be really hard. Even I think Heal is going to pitch really well. I would say watch Luis Heal. I'm excited for him. I'm not sure there's a lane for him to stay unless someone really falls off. I can't really see anyone falling out of the rotation. My guy is Clark Schmidt. Clark Schmidt finished last year with a 4.62 ERA, but I think it's pretty hard to argue that he wasn't the second best pitcher for the Yankees the entire season. And when you look at what he did in the second half, really after a couple rough months, April and May, man, he had some really good stretches. My take for Clark Schmidt, I think he finishes the year with a sub-3-5 ERA. 
Here's my prediction. Trent Grisham is going to have a batting average over 285. Wow. Not a known average guy either. Okay. Is going to surprisingly rake this year. And there are going to be some situations, I guarantee, where Boone is going to bring him in, not necessarily against a lefty, and it's going to pan out. And we're going to be like, wow, aren't we glad that we got Trent Grisham? I like it. I like it. I, I, you know, and I would even go with him hitting 25 home runs aside from the average, but I like that because that means he's, you know, all around complete. We're talking about a guy that's won two gold gloves as well on top of hitting 25 plus home runs in a season. This was a, a really nice pickup for the Yankees to get for uh, with Juan Soto, not, you know, for nothing, but Trent Grisham, I think is such an underlying factor in that trade specifically. So I believe the line was set at 90 and a half or 91 and a half for the Yankees this year. I'm going to take them at 94 wins. I think that's where they slot. I think they will be the first wild card in the American League. I think Baltimore will edge them. I think the young guys do have it on them. They really played like a cohesive unit down there in Baltimore. And obviously with the addition of Corbin Burns, a guy that I was at that game, he was no hitting the Yankees for nine straight innings in a game that the Yankees won. That's just kind of how 2023 went for the Yankees. But only one career start against the Yankees, and it was phenomenal. Obviously, no Aaron Judge, no none of these big bats, but Corbin Burns, 2022 NL Cy Young Award winner, excuse me, 2021 NL Cy Young Award winner. So obviously a free agent as well and will cause some havoc in the AL East, but I'm going to go. The Yankees are going to be the first wild card in the American league at 94 wins. I'll go. I'm going to go 91 wins. I do think that Cole being out, and I think you're going to see Cole be out for a while. I think that's going to hurt a little bit. I still have faith in the rotation, but I think I sell 91 wins to me with the injuries coming into this season would still be really, really good. And would mean that a lot is clicking for this Yankees team. I have them finishing second in the AL East. I'm not sure where that puts them in the wild card. Um, I'd like to think that'd be first, but anything could happen. I think you got a lot of good teams in the West. Um, and I'm honestly not sure who wins the AL East because I could see Baltimore taking that leap. Uh, I, personally want Toronto to finish pretty low, but I can totally see Toronto who outside of losing Matt Chapman, there's a lot of stability there that when are they going to put it together? I could totally see someone else winning the AL East. I don't, I'm not sure it's going to be the Yankees. So I'll go 91 wins and a second place finish in the AL East, but the Yankees return to the playoffs. So the Yankees are winning 107 games. (laughs) What? Wow. 107. What? Good take. Go like for the Yankees it. are winning 107 games. Um, this is in large part due to Carlos Rodon earning the second most Cy Young votes in 2024. Okay. Um, this is also in large part to Anthony Volpe winning his first Silver Slug award at shortstop. Sick. Um, and yeah, Yankees are winning 107 games and uh, losing in the World Series. Uh, I think, I yeah. I think yeah. that I think, would I make me that. Nick's prediction made me the happiest, even though they lose in the World Series, at least they go. And I think if they go to the World Series, that extends Aaron Boone and gives Cashman even more years to his contract. I think World Series appearance here, or at least just, you know, put up, a, you know, a valiant fight. Aaron Boone also in a contract year, so going to need some guys to step up if they want Aaron Boone to stick around, obviously. So, Lots of moves to be made. Very, very appealing. It's, oh man, it's so exciting. The Yankees starting up in about two and a half hours here, Eastern Standard Time at the time of recording. But just before we hop off for your season preview of these 2024 New York Yankees, Nick Palmer went to the media day to try all of the new food at Yankee Stadium. And Nick, you were the only one there. What's going on? What's on the menu? What can fans be excited for when they enter the ballpark here in 2024? Yeah, so both of you bozos were uh, 
either in or coming back from Florida. So unfortunately, you guys couldn't join me, but they uh, they have a new chef this year. And the whole purpose of this, his name is Chef Flowers, by the way. Um, That's a chef fire Flowers, name. his Chef his, Flowers. Uh, his idea was to sort of elevate the dining experience. So not only did I try my first 99 burger, which was there last year. Good and burger. Man, was it fantastic. <laughs> I know you guys got a taste of that as well. Uh, I watched Wagyu the, beef. I watched uh, Lou and Brian's review of it last year. Uh, some great things this year. Uh, you know, Lobel's came back. The uh, Mark Lobel, the owner of Lobel's, was in attendance. Uh, and he introduced the barbecue filet loaded tater tots, which were really good. Uh, my wow. favorite was the new mac and cheese, which they have. Um, it had, uh, it was like so creamy and had like a little bit of ranch, tangy, fantastic. Mm. Uh, some new mojitos for those of you over 21 and some uh, margaritas. Uh, what else? Some fried zeppeli. That was really good. Wow. Uh, some new soft serve ice cream from Blue Bunny, so you don't have to eat oatly every time you go to the stadium. Uh, that was at least a big gripe from me. And a porchetta sandwich, which was crazy. Uh, the fact that they just had that. So excellent stuff. And uh, you should go to some Yankee games this year and pay thirty dollars for uh, for some great food. I saw they're they're making more Wagyu beef ninety nine burgers. They'll have more available this season, which is big. Because mm. the lines have been long, and sometimes it's tough to get those burgers. Yeah, it was did they only sell like ninety nine of them for the game as well? Wasn't that? Yeah, like now the now that number's up to I think one hundred and seven. There you go. All right, a little a dish. How about that? Uh, a little more wagyu beef. Saw some new milkshakes, which were cool. Uh, that too, they were had good. To try that at some point over the summer. All great, great stuff. Glad you had an awesome time. Wish we could have been there with you, Nick, but. Obviously, definitely going to take your word on the Rex. But that is going to do it for your 2024 New York Yankees season preview. Preview. They will play the Houston Astros down in Houston at 4.10 p.m. Eastern time today, Thursday, at the time of recording. So game one of 162, it's going to be a long six months, and we're going to be here every step of the way. For Nick Palmer and Lou Orlando, I'm Will Talent saying so long for now and let's go Yankees.